entitled Bible 101, and the idea is to give you an overview of the sections of the scriptures. We have, um, we looked at the first five books, the Pentateuch, the law, uh, we've looked at the histories, and we've looked at the wisdom literature, which includes the Psalms and Proverbs. Um, in two weeks, we'll look at the prophets, um, particularly the Advent prophets, the prophets that um, point towards Christmas. We've uh, looked at the Gospels, and we've looked at the book of Revelation. So this week, we're going to look at the book of Acts. Next week will be the epistles, the letters of Paul. So to give you a little bit of background, um, as I mentioned when we talked about the Gospels last week, the four Gospels um, were not the first pieces written. Actually, the first pieces of the New Testament that were written were the letters of Paul. And in fact, the letter that you heard Lois read today from Thessalonians is the earliest piece of New Testament literature that we have. Um, it was the first letter that Paul wrote um, and one of the most ancient documents in the New Testament for Christians. That um, letter of Thessalonians is a part of the body that we call the epistles. Most of the epistles were written by Paul. Um, some were not. Some were attributed to Paul, but not written by Paul. We'll cover all that next week, and there will be a test following, so I hope you're paying attention. The book of Acts is a continuation of the book of Luke. So stay with me here for a minute. The Gospel of Mark was written first, then Luke and Matthew, and then sometime later the book of John. But the author of Luke also wrote the book of Acts, and scholar, the vast majority of scholars agree on this, um, that if you read the last part of Luke and continued reading into the first part of Acts, it's the, it's the same style of writing, um, the same vocabulary, the same focus, so um, it's not always recognized because the Gospel of John is between them. But the book of Acts is the story of the disciples and the early church. And it also is a book that helps explain the authority of Paul. Because when we read Paul's letters, Paul has an authority problem. And Paul continually says in his letters, I am an apostle. No one preached the gospel to me but Jesus himself. And so when you go through Paul's letters, you'll hear him continually stating his authority coming directly from Jesus. The book of Acts tells the story of the disciples and presents the situation of Paul. And the second half of Acts is almost entirely the story of Paul's ministry. And that helps prepare a context then for the letters of Paul that follow. So the book of Acts, I'm going to give a quick overview, but I'm going to focus on the middle part. So if you want to follow along, you're welcome to. The first chapter of Acts, and I'm not going to hit them all, I'm just going to hit the highlights because there's 28 chapters. The first book of Acts is about the ascension of Jesus. Jesus has, in the book of Luke, Jesus died, was buried, and raised on the third day and then had a number of appearances to the disciples. In the book of Acts, we have the ascension of Jesus going up into heaven. And so the ascension of Jesus happens, and then they pick a new disciple. Remember, they're one disciple down because of Judas. Uh, Judas, who betrayed Jesus and then killed himself. There was an opening, and they had a lottery, which the United Methodist Church does not support. But they had a lottery to draw the name of the new disciple, and they filled back up to 12. Now, there is big tension about whether or not Paul is a real apostle. Big tension. This is the first part of it. They've already chosen the 12th disciple, and it's not Paul. You with me? The tension builds. Chapter 2 is the story of Pentecost, perhaps the most famous passage from the book of Acts, where on the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Acts 2, 1 and following. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and to begin to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. This is the fulfillment of the vision of the Trinity that is cast forth in Matthew. Go forth and make disciples of Jesus Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here you have God's always been around. Jesus, according to the Gospel of John, has also always been around with God and with the Holy Spirit. But now that Jesus has ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit comes the next chapter to be present with the church to guide the church forever. And God willing, the, church, the Holy Spirit shows up in worship every single Sunday. Amen? Well, that didn't sound like the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. All right. Work mercy. I got my work cut out today. In the fifth chapter, we hear about the um, apostles being persecuted. So the apostles are going out and telling the story of Jesus, and not everyone was excited to hear this story. The people who had been a part of the Jewish tradition were not happy to hear a movement with Jesus coming around and being preached to the Jewish community. Also, people who were not Jewish, who were called Gentiles, who were people of other faith, um, who believed in other gods, they were not very happy about it either. And the Roman emperor, the Roman emperor was not an ordinary ruler. The Roman emperor was a ruler slash god, not dissimilar to Pharaoh. You remember Pharaoh in the Old Testament was the leader of Egypt. He was not only the leader of Egypt, he was also considered a god. The ruler of the, the emperor of Rome was considered in the same light. And so there was a worship of the temple, a worship of the emperor. And when the emperor's followers heard word of another god, and remember the words kingdom of heaven can also be translated empire of heaven and is a direct affront to Roman rule. So the message of Jesus was not well received. When they say Jesus is the king of kings, the emperor of Rome was called the king of kings. The son of man, the emperor of Rome was called the son of man. The disciples had adopted many of the terms assigned to the emperor and they were using them to describe Jesus, the son of God. Jesus, the son of God, the emperor was considered the son of God. So when you have this direct conflict with the Jewish tradition and with the ruler of the day, okay, you don't have any friends, right? No one was happy, and the apostles were being actively persecuted. In the midst of that, they realize, you know, we're doing all this good work, but there are people who have needs. We need to take care of the poor and the sick. So they choose seven, and the leader of them is Stephen. In fact, many churches have what's called a Stephen's ministry, any of you been part of a Stephen's ministry? It's an active ministry that cares for the poor and the sick in the congregations. Stephen, though, for doing good works, was arrested and ultimately stoned to death. And here continues the controversy of Paul. This is in Acts chapter 7, verse 54, 5-4. When the rulers of the day heard the things that Stephen was doing, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout rushed together against him. And they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, Stephen prayed, let Lord Jesus receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he died. And Saul approved of their killing him. So you have a remnant, uh, a reminiscent of Jesus' death when Jesus said, if 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, when he was on the cross. Stephen says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And Saul was watching and approved. And then in chapter 8 it says, That day a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women, and committing them to prison. So Saul was, made himself the head of the persecution of the new church. Actively imprisoning and actively approving of the killing of the Christians. Then we come to chapter 9. And chapter 9 is the conversion of Saul. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, and the way was another term for the Christian tradition, the, the newly growing Christian tradition, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along on the road to Damascus, you remember children's time? Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he asked, Who are you, Lord? And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he was blind. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Three days? Sound familiar? Jesus was buried for three days in the dark. Paul was in the dark without light for three days. And now there was a disciple in Damascus called Ananias. Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he ain't said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen a vision. A man named Ananias come, come in, will come in and lay his hands on him, so he might regain his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So picture this. The Lord said to Ananias, You're going to go greet this scoundrel and pray for him in my name. And Ananias is no fool. He says, well, wait, wait a minute. Everybody that's invoked your name in front of this guy has ended up in jail or dead. I'm not going. And the Lord said, go anyway. I have personally converted him. So Ananias went. Imagine how, imagine how quickly Ananias skipped into this house. Do you think he was not going with fear and trembling? He's going to the very man who has the authority to throw him in jail or kill him. I'm thinking Ananias is creeping into the house. Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands upon Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Paul's eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Amazing conversion, but everybody is still afraid of him. Picture that. 
Everyone's still afraid of him. The man has been an accessory to imprisonment and murder. And now he's a believer. Can you imagine the skepticism among the other disciples? The other disciples weren't looking for another disciple, were they? They already had one. They had already filled the empty slot. They were regained at full strength of 12. They had bound together against the persecution. And now their chief enemy, the number one persecutor of the church, is going to join them. Now, how would you feel about that? Would you be a little skeptical? Would you be a little doubtful that this scoundrel could turn into a, not just an okay person? Because typically when we, when we see a scoundrel, and usually who gets to decide who a scoundrel is, right? When we see a scoundrel converted, well, they can just be an okay person. But do they get to be a leader? Do they get to be the chosen one of God? Do they get to be the one who is the most famous character in the New Test Testament outside of Jesus? Well, it's not fair, is it? But here is Paul with his own conversion and conviction. And it's no wonder that every letter he writes, people are doubting him about whether he has any credibility or authority. And why in each of his letters he repeats, I am an apostle chosen by Jesus. Not converted by any human, but chosen by Jesus. But you can imagine the disconnect for the rest. In chapter 12, just a few chapters later, Peter, Peter who's been with Jesus from day one, Peter who was there at the very beginning, Peter who was the one when Jesus said, who do people say that I am? It was Peter who said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And it was Peter for whom Jesus said in front of everybody as a witness, on you I will build my church. You are no longer Simeon, but you are now Peter the Rock, and on you I will build my church. It was Peter who was with Jesus when the storm came in the boat, and Peter said, let me walk on water too. It was Peter who got out of the boat. The rest of the disciples were like, that guy's crazy. It was Peter that got out of the boat, and when he started to sink, Jesus saved him by the hand. It, it, was, it was Peter who proclaimed to Jesus, I'm, I'm never going to let anything bad happen to you. And it was Peter who betrayed Jesus three times. It, it, it was Peter who had been with Jesus even at the time of the resurrection. When Jesus had to ask him three times, do you love me? And Peter brought to tears, Lord, you know that I love you. I've been with you the whole time. Your whole ministry, I've never left you. Well, I've kind of left you, but I'm back. It's Peter who struggled with his faith all three years of Jesus' ministry. It's Peter who is the rock of the church. It is Peter who has been delivering the message. And in fact, earlier it says in Acts, Peter was sent by Jesus to teach the word to the Gentiles. It's interesting, isn't it? We always think of Paul as the one going to the Gentiles, but Peter went first. So here's Peter, the rock of the church, the most respected member. And then Peter, in verse 12, both Peter and James are imprisoned, and James is killed. James is killed because of the persecution of the church. Now, this is three chapters after Paul's conversion, but the persecution still going on. The persecution that Paul started, the, the mess that he made is still imprisoning and killing disciples. And it even imprisoned Peter and killed James. Paul's outrageous behavior is still killing disciples. Even though he's converted now, or he says he is, the work that Saul had started as a persecutor of the church was still hurting the church, and even the pillar Peter was imprisoned because of his work. And now, in chapter 15, it all comes to a head in Jerusalem. There's a fracas. 
So the good news is people say, well, I don't like churches that have arguments. Me either. Anyone ever been to a church that's had an argument? I'll tell you what, the color of carpet split more churches than Jesus, I guarantee you that. The f I remind people that um, disagreements in the church began as soon as there was a church. All the letters of Paul are written to address disagreements in the church. Yes? Every letter of Paul is about an argument that people are having, and Paul writes them with a new understanding of how they can live together. The good news is the church has been fighting as long as it's been together. Doesn't that make us feel good? The first fight was about whether or not the new Gentiles that were coming in, that both Peter and Paul were bringing into the church, should have to become Jewish before they became Christian. Right? We don't think about that much. We think about that now. Do you have to be a good Methodist before you, become, before you accept Jesus? We don't think so. We think you have to accept Jesus before you can be a good Methodist. But back then, it was you had to be Jewish first, convert to Judaism, and accept all of the traditions before you could be Christian. So a fracas breaks out, and Paul is on the side of the Gentiles saying you don't have to be Jewish first. Who's listening to Paul at this? Anybody? Paul is the scoundrel who's been getting people killed, who's watching Stephen be killed, who they picked. He's claiming to be an apostle that no one else chose. He is, his persecution has continued to destroy the church. And now he's standing up offering the church and telling the church how it ought to operate. How'd you like to be at that trustees meeting? And all the trustees thinking, where have you been? And what have you been doing? If you, if you have a building committee to rebuild the church that an arsonist has burned down, are you inviting the arsonist to suggest the architecture of the new church? Oh, but I found Jesus. Well, why don't you find Jesus across the street? We'll build our own church. You can feel the tension in the scripture, and without knowing the history of Paul's work, this meeting is just an ordinary church fight. This is no ordinary church fight. This is the worst person coming to tell them how to run the new church. The winning speech was given not by Paul, but by Peter. It's Peter who steps in and agrees with Paul that they don't have to become Jewish first. They could just go straight on into being Christian. But friends, I guarantee you, if it hadn't been Peter himself, imprisoned himself by Paul's work, who stood up and agreed, this fight never would have been resolved. Does that just not give more credibility to Peter? I mean, this man's been there from the beginning. This guy's been there from the first piece of Jesus' ministry. Peter has been through it all. And Peter's the one that stands up and says, I don't care about his past. He's right. And that's how we're all going to do it. It's Peter who ultimately gives permission for the church to accept Paul. That's genius. It's brilliant. The rest of the book of Acts is about Paul's journey. One great asset in your Bible study is looking at maps. Many Bibles that you buy have maps in the back, and most of them have a map that traces Paul's ministry that's mostly recorded from the book of Acts that shows his different uh, paths of ministry as he goes from place to place.
And Paul becomes, as we know the remainder of the story, one of the most important figures in the Christian church. So you've heard me use this analogy before, and I love it, so I'm going to use it again. Peter and Paul represent two different journeys to Christ. I like to call Peter the crockpot Christian. Put him in in the morning, and it takes all day, doesn't it? In fact, have you ever come home from work and it still wasn't done? And you've got to put it in on even longer, and then we'll just cook it and eat it tomorrow. Paul is the ultimate microwave Christian. You pop him in and in five minutes he's done and he's ready to eat. The church for generations has celebrated the microwave Christian as the right way. This, mat, this, this dramatic conversion, this seeing a light and falling to the ground, to being blinded by the light, to go from being a horrible, horrible sinner to being, a, to being the champion of the faith. I mean, that's, that's worse to first right there. That would make the newspaper. The church has always championed the microwave Christian. But most of us, many of us, I count myself as one, I'm kind of a crockpot Christian. Because I don't have really good preaching story. You know, if I had done drugs or sold drugs or been in a gang... I was totally a loser. I didn't do any of that. I just kind of followed along. I went to church every Sunday. I even went to church. Are you sitting down? I even went to church in college. And nobody, in fact, I was one of the only ones. Me and a couple faculty members sitting there in the chapel. I don't know what was wrong with me. But, I, but when you have a faith that goes from maybe you're not a horrible person to being a better person, I mean, the gap's only like that big. But the microwave Christian, if you can go from being a scoundrel to being a superstar for the faith, that's exciting. The church forever has celebrated the, the transformation. But we've not done a very good job celebrating the process of discipleship through our lives and the decision points of faith throughout our lives that may not be super dramatic, but they matter. And I think the church would do better to, to honor the regular ups and downs of faith because, folks, there are days when I'm just sure. And then I have days like Peter that I'm kind of standing outside the boat and sinking, and I'm not sure. But then Jesus comes along and, and, and helps me along. I mean, Paul was sure, and he never looked back. Wouldn't that be great? But a lot of folks are like this, good old Peter. But when Peter was needed, the faith was always there. And I think we would do well to celebrate both kinds of conversion, if you will, at the church. Both kinds of discipleship at the church. So think about it today. Are you more of a crockpot Christian? Or are you more of a microwave Christian? Were you really rotten and then ready to eat? Frozen and ready to eat? Isn't that amazing in the microwave? Frozen, ready to eat. Like that. Or are you one that's just kind of marinating for a while? You'd get some of that, you need a little tenderizing. The good news is, somewhere in the middle of the book of Acts, these two groups came together and formed a church that has stood the test of time for 2,000 years. At some point, these two groups came together and said, I don't know about your faith and you don't understand mine, but we're going to walk together with this man named Jesus and we're going to serve one another and we're going to preach the good news and we're going to work together and we're going to build a church out of the love of God that's going to keep moving 
And friends, the power of those two groups coming together has never been stopped. So my invitation to you today is if you're in need of conversion, I pray that you see the light today. If you're just in needing of another 30 minutes before you're ready to eat, I want you just to soak up that cooking right now and keep on that journey of faith for the next decision that you have to make where your faith is going to make all the difference. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the book of Acts, for telling us the story from Jesus' ascension to Paul's journey all the way to Rome. And Lord, we thank you for the message that no matter how we come to the church or come to the faith or how our struggle is, that you're going to be right there with us. And you're going to follow us every step of the way, filling us each morning when the lights come on with your amazing light of love and grace. Lord, walk with us wherever we are in our faith journey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.